So we have three speakers today on an amazingly large and wonderful topic, Blue Camus. So our first speaker will be Katie Matthews. Uh, Katie worked for the Park Service, has worked for the Park Service since 2007. And then she came into the Nez Perce um, in 2015. Uh, she went to undergrad at Ithaca College at New York State, and then her master's at the University of Idaho. And her next tattoo will be Scottish Thistle. So I won't tell you any more about that, but you can ask her about it. <laughs> uh, following Katie, we'll have Steve Putzel. Uh, Steve's a UM alumni. Uh, he started with Native Point Restoration in 1991 and has been doing it ever since. He's been working with the Nature Conservancy for the last 19 years. And his favorite um, plant is the ponderosa pine. And finally, we'll have Jen McNew. Well, Jen and Steve will kind of tag team the last bit. Jen is over here. Um, Jen graduated from Western Washington University. She's worked with BLM since 2013 and loves the spotted saxifrage, among many other plants. So with that, um, will um, anybody on Zoom, please let me know if you are having trouble hearing. Um, otherwise, we will take it away. Okay. You don't want any questions during the presentation. Uh, I think we're going to ask for them afterwards. So, that's fair. <laughs> Tell your neighbor. <laughs> okay. Sorry, just making sure the sound is working. Mm -hmm. Can't add to my notes. <laughs> 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 All right, great. We're good. I'm going to um, let Katie take it away. Thank you. Yeah. Is that good? Darker? Oh, I'm getting messages. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, um, good evening. I um, I first want to thank Jen and Steve for geeking out on Canvas with me so much over the last couple of months. Uh, it's really been great getting to know them and having um, really great conversations about this plant. Uh, I also want to thank the Nature Conservancy, University of Montana, and the Montana Native Plant Society for inviting me. Um, so I'm really excited to be speaking to you about Canvas and Canvas restoration. Uh, as for, I was introduced, my name's Katie Matthews. I'm the natural resource specialist for Nez Perce National Historical Park, Big Hole National Battlefield, and Whitman Mission National Historic Site. Um, so tonight I am gonna take you west just a little bit for a little while. Don't worry, you'll come back to Montana, but we're gonna go talk about Idaho for just a little bit. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about Weite Prairie, which is one of the sites that Nez Perce National Historical Park is responsible for protecting. Uh, I'll take a little bit of time to describe Canvas to familiarize us all, make sure we're all on the same page with the plant and the site, uh, and then we'll get into some of the thesis work that I completed in 2020 through the University of Idaho, looking at restoration strategies for the propagation of Kamasia Quamish on the Weite Prairie. Uh, investigating the preferred site characteristics and best management practices for restoring these important ecosystems, of which and, uh, National Park Service is responsible for a few of them. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm the Natural Resource Specialist for Nez Perce National Historical Park, Big Hole National Battlefield, and Whitman Mission National Historic Site. Uh, just a little bit of background on Nez Perce National Historic um, Park and Big Hole. We uh, manage them together. So it's not like a lot of your other National Park Service sites that you think about when you're thinking about like Yosemite or Yellowstone, these big contiguous land spaces. We have 38 sites and we cover four states, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. And the mission of these parks is to tell um, the story of, and culture of Nez Perce people, past, present, and future. Um, so this map shows um, some of our, it shows the sites some of them are um, more pronounced than others, but 
you can see here the ones marked with um, blue stars are where there are camas populations um, that are associated with Nez Perce National Historical Park. And just an aside, um, I am a National Park Service employee. We love our acronyms and mm -hmm. we often refer to Nez Perce National Historical Park because it is quite a mouthful, mouthful as Meepy. So if you catch me saying Meepy, that's what I'm talking about, but I'll try really hard not to do that. So this- Did you share your screen? We can't see anything on Zoom. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that was like a Wizard of Oz moment. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. That should be that. And there's some that there's some that's right. Yep. Um, Thank you. Right. Yeah, thanks for letting us know to you out there in the world. Um, okay, so this uh, these are some pictures from Big Hole National Battlefield during the Hamas bloom. As you can see, we've got quite a nice little population there in the encampment area. Those are uh, tiki poles in the back. Um, Big Hole uh, was... Um, so Camus is a, it's a contributing factor as to why the Nez Perce um, spent time in the area. Uh, I am lucky enough to get to spend a lot of spring and summer. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't realize I did that. <laughs> That's okay. Where does it you go? Can just close it. Oh, this is beyond me right now. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> So um, I do get to go to the Big Hole site fairly often, monitoring Camas, Lenhai, Penstemon, and also doing some invasive species work. So get to spend um, my time in Montana, thank goodness. Uh, and I, so I hope some of you are familiar with Big Hole. It's actually not that far away, um, but if you're not, I really recommend checking it out. Um, we also have Camas at the heart of the monster site, which is the site of Nez Perce creation story. And then, we ate prairie, which is an important traditional harvest site, which we'll get into a little bit later. There are other sites that are part of the Nez Perce National Historical Park, um, and we're, they're co-managed with other land management agencies with varying degrees of management involvement. So two of those are Muscleshell Meadows and Packer Meadows. Um, Muscleshell is located near We ate Prairie, where I'm taking you this evening. Uh, and then Packer is up near Bolo Pass. Um, these are primarily managed by the Forest Service, but they are also Nez Perce National Historical Site. So um, there are five species in the Camassia genus. Four of them are located in the West, Camassia Quamish, Camassia lectinii, Camassia Kasikii, and Camassia Haulii. Um, we're gonna focus primarily on Camassia Quamish, and there are six subspecies um, that are in our area based on the most recent Hitchcock and Cronquest edition. Um, Quamish, Brevifolia, Maxima, Intermedia, or sorry, Intermediate, Utensis, and Azuria. Uh, Camasia Quamish is the major vegetative component of the Camas, plant, Camas Prairie plant community in the inland Northwest. And it grows in these large uh, colonies. Um, these Camas, they're, uh, they're Camas dominated wetlands and they're often referred to as Camas Prairies. Uh, they range from Northern California up into Southern uh, British Columbia and over as far as Montana and Utah. Their distribution is the result of natural dispersal processes. It's, they're widely distributed amongst seasonal wet prairie habitats. And um, it's been around for about 70,000 years based on pollen data. Oh, and should mention, the first collection was made by Lewis and Clark in 1806 at Weite Prairie. So that um, is the type site. So it's a long-lived perennial geophyte. So it has a bulb. Um, the leaves emerge in late winter. They have uh, blue, white, or deep violet um, flowers that range from about four to 35 flowers per racine. Um, some defining characteristics are that they are bilaterally to occasionally nearly <laughs> radically symmetric 
basically common camas, which is also known as blue camas, which is also known as commosic bonish, um, they're slightly asymmetric. And that's a little bit different than grade camas, which is commosia lectinii. Those tend to be larger and their petals are more evenly spaced. But um, with the commosia quamish, that lower sepal is declined from the others. And so it's a good characteristic. Um, they have a superior ovary, simple fruits, they're uh, capsules. Um, they can have up to 35 capsules and 36 seeds per capsule. So they can have a lot of plants or a lot of seeds rather. Uh, they're about or one to two feet tall and they go into a dormancy period after their seeds mature in the late fall. As I mentioned, they live, they tend to uh, exist in large colonies that we refer to as chemist prairies. They are uh, foraged by deer, elk, moose, and gophers. And gophers will often stash the camas, um, contributing to bulb dispersal. And it also provides, a, uh, provides resources for several different varying insects. Um, there's, it's been noted that honeybees, bumblebees, mason bees, butterflies, hoverflies, beetles, and lady beetles have been um, uh, visiting these, these uh, plants. They reproduce primarily by seed uh, and less often by offset bulblets. The bulbs are multi-generational, so the older outer scales of the bulb are known as the mother bulb, and they provide energy, nutrients, and mo uh, moisture for the daughter bulb, which is enclosed in, in um, and developing within that mother bulb. The mother bulb eventually senesces, and then it's replaced by that daughter bulb, and that just continues that cycle. Uh, it has contractile roots, and those help pull the bulb down to where it prefers to be in that soil profile. That can be anywhere from about 10 to uh, 20 centimeters, depending on the, um, the soil conditions. Uh, the bulb is made up of um, 52 to 49% inulin. Inulin is a complex carbohydrate, really hard to digest. So not recommended to eat camas, just a meat, like out of the ground, highly don't recommend doing that. <laughs> um, you will spend the lo a long time in the bathroom if you do that, so don't do it. <laughs> um, they, uh, the seeds need to go through a cold stratification process in order to break dormancy, um, and they can take about four, three to five years to flower depending on the conditions in the environment. Um, research shows that the seed and bulb establishment can be negatively affected by lacking proper hydrology, increased soil compaction, presence of invasive species, as well as thick sods and litter layers. So camas is a facultative wetland species. It grows, like I said, in large colony, uh, colonies called camas prairies. And a productive camas prairie, um, it's been determined it's at least about 300 plants per square meter, but um, it's likely can have much more. They prefer seasonal wetlands that are saturated during the growing season and dry in the summer. They um, prefer extensive moisture with unrestrained drainage. However, too moist, they can have negative effects on the flowering, seed dispersal, and the bulbs could rot. But if it's too hot or dry, that also doesn't promote camas growth. Soils tend to be derived from basalt parent material, and they have high silt and soil, or sorry, high silt and clay contents with a loamy texture. The pH tends to be acidic to slightly basic, and it's been um, researched that the more basic the soil, you're more inclined to have a bluer camas, and if it has more acidic soils, then it will um, tend to be more of that purple color. Uh, in winter, the soils are soft and wet, and in the summer, they're dry and hard, and it um, seems to like disturbance, such as digging, which can aerate the soil, reducing competition, However, too much disturbance by things like overgrazing or repetitive mowing, that can lead to soil compaction, which can have negative effects on camas populations. So not all disturbance is good disturbance. So we're heading west now. So we're all going to Idaho, Weite Prairie. It's located in North Central Idaho. Uh, the entire wetland space is about 450 square kilometers, but the park site itself is 110 hectares. It's surrounded by agriculture that's primarily um, cattle, uh, cattle operations, and it is bisected by a creek which is getting deeper by the day. Um, the park site itself is about 
917 to 922 meters in elevation. Um, but for the most part, there's not a lot of uh, gradient between uh, where the camas is. I think most of that drop is actually the incising of some of that creek bed. Uh, annual precipitation is pretty good. You get a good amount of um, precip and it gets um, to be fairly cold to fairly warm. I think the extremes can be really, um, really extreme out there, but the average temperature is about 25 to 63 degrees Fahrenheit. So we at Prairie, it is a National Park Service site, and it is so because it's where natural and cultural significance meets. So it's an important gathering place for Nez Perce people. Um, the camas bulbs from Nez Perce, they're known to have larger sized, superior taste and greater quantities. And it's thought that we at Prairie helped contribute to that. Um, it's also the site of first contact between Nez Perce and the Corps of Discovery in 1805. And it was a productive, um, productive site with high camas densities, and it still has a lot of density, high density today. So this sacred plant, it's been noted as the most important root food for many indigenous groups across Northwestern United States and Southwestern Canada. The stable and ubiquitous nature of camas allowed for this plant to be gathered, processed, and stored in large quantities, making it an important winter food for Nez Perce and other indigenous people across the region. It has really good nutritional content and cooked camas is high in protein, having more than beef liver, beans, or potatoes. Uh, across its range, it's harvested um, at different times, usually late spring, but Nez Perce typically was late summer and early fall. Uh, it's dark, but <laughs> it did bring uh, two gifts, which is, I don't know if you guys can see that out here, but um, it is a digging stick that is used uh, by um, people to harvest camas. You put it into the ground. Oh, there we go, light. Um, put it into the ground. You pry up the soil. The soil then flips over and there's camas bulbs located underneath that top layer of soil. Once you have unearthed that, those camas bulbs, then you would use your basket to collect those camas bulbs. This one is a smaller version. It tends to go on your hip belt, so then you can easily um, collect when you're, um, when you're moving around. When this would get filled up, there's larger bags that would get, um, get used to, to fill up as you're going throughout the, throughout the process. I don't know if you guys got to see that. <laughs> um, so, uh, after the bulbs were harvested, they uh, were generally prepared, prepared for consumption um, and long-term storage through cooking in earthen ovens or camas pits. And this process often lasted multiple days uh, where bulbs were put in a large pit with rocks and vegetation. A fire was lit on top of that with, um, that required constant tending and it utilized steam to help break down that inulin that I was talking about and that turns it into an easily digestible fructose. So it gets this really sweet flavor. And then depending on which vegetation you're using, that can help um, flavor that chemist as well. Um, roasted chemists can be dried, stored, or crushed into other foodstuffs. So you can eat it just as is, or it could be created for use for porridge or breads or cakes. And then the, um, just the process of it in general, it helps encourage social interactions through communal gatherings, so uh, fostering trade, it provided food for travel because it traveled really well, it, uh, it lasted really long. Um, and it was an important component of feasts and celebrations. It was also used to flavor other foods uh, like meats and um, it was, uh, it's often used as a treat or a special food. And it's sometimes considered like candy. So camas is significantly important to Nez Perce culture and traditional practice, and Nez Perce traditional ecological knowledge is significantly important to camas. Reliance on this important food fostered management, um, management practices that encourage and cultivated productive camas prairie habitat. So it's a traditionally cultivated plant. Horticulture techniques such as burning, weeding, selective harvesting, um, they result in those high camas yields. Fire was used to clear the prairies out of vegetation and encroaching timber. Uh, and then it also put nutrients back into the soil. 
Um, in terms of selective harvesting, there's a common phrase when you speak with nest first diggers, um, the more you dig, the more you get. So when you selective harvest, you're um, turning up that soil, introducing oxygen into that system, encouraging nutri nutrient cycling, reducing interspecific competition. So you're opening up these areas from other plants coming in. And um, when with that selective harvesting, you're removing those appropriately sized bulbs. So generally kind of a rule of thumb, stuff bigger than your thumb. So you're leaving the, the other ones there for future generations. And then additionally, you're also spreading the seed during the appropriately timed seasons of the phenology of the plant. So it really is encouraging that plant and that habitat. And then cultivation of this plant. So it in turn, um, yeah, it managed um, to maintain that culture or that healthy Camas Prairie ecosystem. But these places have been privatized and fenced off. So those connections have been lost, removing traditional harvest um, management techniques that once encouraged and facilitated these healthy Camas Prairie habitats. So just a little background on Camas Prairies. They're a unique type of wetland that are dominated by Camas plants and associated wet prairie vegetation. They were once widely distributed throughout the Pacific Northwest prior to Euro-American settlement. Due to the absence of these prairies, it provided, um, or sorry, due to the abundance of these prairies, it provided a sustained and reliable food source that, as I mentioned, was fostered by management practices that cultivated productive Camas prairie habitat and provided traditional harvest sites for many indigenous groups throughout the Pacific Northwest. As I mentioned in previous slides, these horticulture techniques employed through traditional ecological knowledge included things like birding, feeding, selective harvesting, um, and they resulted in those high camas yields and encouraged the growth of this sacred plant and a staple food source, which in turn promoted and sustained that prairie ecosystem. So with the privatization of land came changes in how the land was managed, incorporating different ideas of how to work the landscape. So this land use change from activities associated with facilitating high camas yields, um, as I described earlier, to land conversion that better suited Euro-American agricultural practices. And this led to the decline of this important wetland ecosystem. Um, and it makes Camas Prairie as one of the most endangered habitats in North America. Uh, in, the, in, in the area that We Ate Prairie is located, which is often associated with the Palouse bioregion, it's estimated that one to three percent of these prairies are left um, when it was estimated that they used to be about 13 percent of the area consisting of Camas Prairie. So these land management changes were primarily introduced to encourage cereal and forage crops. So things like changing the hydrology, the uh, introducing non-native vegetation, and employing intensive land practices can have negative effects on Camas um, prairie ecosystems. So as I mentioned, Camas are a type of wetlands. I recognize this slide is super busy <laughs> and it's kind of hard to tell what's going on, but that's because that's what wetlands are. They have a lot going on and it's not always obvious um, at first glance, everything that's going on there. But my point with this is, that wetlands are really important ecosystems that provide a variety of important ecological functions. And all of that happens at We at Prairie with every single one of those pictures. So, so reduction or um, reduction of, of wetland systems, they can negatively affect the overall landscape function. And this is a result primarily of conversion to agriculture, altering the hydrology of these areas and invasive species presence. So as you can see, um, about, we've lost over time about 53% of wetlands across the United States, about 56 in Idaho alone, and 97% in uh, the Palouse region. So at Nespers National Historical Park, we looked at Camas as a vital sign for the health of this culturally and ecologically important landscape. We often like to put natural resources and cultural resources in separate boxes. But I'm hoping that I'm hoping to show you tonight that they actually go hand in hand. People made and contributed to these systems. Camas is a cultural keystone species, meaning it's not only um, it's not important not only to the ecological community, but it's also an integral part of um, the. Or sorry, it's it's also got cultural value um, to to indigenous people who once depended on it and still hold it very sacred today. 
So since Camas is identified as a focal species for the park, we've invested in the site to both understand and restore the Camas prairie through research and investigation. So I won't go too much into this, but we keep studying and learning as much as we can um, to inform our management decisions. So in 2015, we tested the feasibility of restoring an irrigation canal. So unfortunately, I don't have a before picture, um, but this whole space here was covered with reef hairy grass and it was deeply incised with a channel, an irrigation channel. So we uh, removed the, or the reef canary grass off site. Um, one thing that was really cool when we did that, we found canvas bulbs just coming out of the ground. So it was hiding underneath there. It just couldn't get out from under that reef, uh, reef canary grass. We brought fill in to cover up the remainder of that vegetative uh, reef canary grass because I don't know how many are familiar with that, but it really spreads um, and it's hard to get those rhizomes under control. Uh, we then applied topsoil to that fill material. Um, oh, and we used that fill to also fill in that deep incised canal. We then took heavy equipment to roll over it to help get some of that compaction and get it um, to sit in place where it was. And then um, that winter, we did start to see the water dispersed. So previously, you would just have a channel full of water and nothing really happening outside of it. Once we filled this in, we started to see sheet flow across the site, which was what we were looking for. Because previously, those irrigation canals, they're meant to dry out the prairie um, because forage grasses, they prefer a drier habitat. But Camas likes its feet wet. So we wanted to bring back the water. Um, and so we did observe Camas in the restoration area in the spring. And you can see it started to kind of encroach in there and we were seeing it even further in than we had expected to. We um, planted plugs of native sedges uh, also in 2016 to help fill in that area and help with that com uh, competition for um, non-native species coming in. So we use native sedges that we collected the seed from the area, had someone grow them off site, and then brought them back and planted those plugs. Uh, and then we also implemented photo monitoring so we can keep up with what's going on there. But so here's some of our, you can see our, our plugs on the edges there, um, and the camera is just kind of starting to pop out, um, which is really exciting to see. So we at Prairie, it's an ideal study site because it has a familiar land use history that we see across the Pacific Northwest. Uh, traditionally, it's an important gathering place for Camas, as I've already talked about. And then in the late 1800s, it was converted to, um, or from productive Camas prairie habitat to agricultural land. And this was accomplished primarily by altering the hydrology, uh, introducing European pasture grasses, um, and this was a common practice that you see across the Pacific Northwest. So it's applicable across the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we at Prairie has a long history of about 100 plus years of agriculture use. And so it's, um, they altered the, that altered the vegetation and hydrology. But what makes We at Prairie different than a lot of other spaces is it's, it's designated as a cultural keystone place. Because as I pointed out earlier, natural and cultural resources are not two different things. So uh, we at Prairie exemplifies that connection. Um, it's uh, an important gathering place for Nez Perce and other indigenous people. And it was also the site of first contact between Nez Perce people and the Lewis and Clark Corps of Discovery. And so because of these reasons, it was designated as a national historical landmark on the register of national historic places in 1976. And then it was designated a national park service site in 1992. And what these designations do are they provide protection. Uh, protection from further development, and the ability to commit to restore these lands, which is an important component of creating, restoring, and maintaining these areas. Um, so one way that the park has done this is through research. So as you saw with my last few slides, um, but we at Prairie, it provides a valuable research area where we've done a number of studies conducted looking at vegetation, hydrology, soil, wildlife uses, um, and we're trying to determine the character of the site, and that allows researchers and managers to apply adaptive management principles. And that way we can, as we learn more about the site, we're managing it appropriately. 
So I'm not going to go too deep into this because I think I've demonstrated the importance of restoring these places to a functioning wet prairie ecosystem um, that can facilitate a return to these culturally significant landscapes by reestablishing that functionality and connection to that landscape. But essentially what we're doing here is cultural restoration. So um, it's a great species to use for restoration projects for a number of reasons listed here. It's culturally significant and it's ecologically significant because of its role and function in wetland ecosystems, but it's also important for restoring cultural significance and cultural ecosystem management. So the idea for this being, if you restore for camas, then uh, the, the species that are associated with that, um, with those camas prairies will follow. So in 2005, the park began to actively monitor the camas populations within the park site. So we connect with local school groups. We go into the classroom. We teach them about camas, about the natural and cultural significance of camas. And then we take them out into the field and they get to do hands-on monitoring with us at Wee Prairie. We've been doing this for about 17 years now. Um, we have noticed a, a slight increase in camas density across the site, particularly in 2009 to 2007 then it started to decrease and decline again. So we have some new questions. Um, essentially what we were, had done was we removed grazing from the site and have been doing more or less passive management. Uh, so that initial removal of grazing seems to have increased the, the densities, but um, now there seems to be a decline happening. So one question that kept coming up and drove a lot of the research that I did was, um, why does cameras grow so well in some areas and so poorly in others when these areas are literally within meters apart from each other? So we decided to focus on areas of low and high camas density to pull apart those differences in habitat preferences for camas, with the goal being that we can restore the site to allow for those preferred site conditions that we identify. So, um, in the middle, we have the National Park Service site. The red circle there is the project area. Um, and then I'm not going to say right or left because it's very confusing when I'm standing <laughs> in front of you and with Zoom. But um, on, uh, we also have a map of the uh, canvas density um, that's found across the MPS site. And then uh, the other one just shows some topographic context. Um, so these are just the, the two, plot, two uh, examples of the plots that we had. So you've got the high camas density over there. And as you um, can maybe see all that green, that's pretty much camas. So it's about 98% camas within there. Uh, so heavily dense with camas. And then on the other side, the low camas density, you're lucky if you've got 1% camas. It's under there, we've found it, but it's not coming up. Um, so the thing that I kind of want to point out with the slide is that this area is bright. So you can kind of see the difference in color. So they're really, there's just a line of really good camas density and really poor camas density. So um, my study objectives were first to determine what camas needs specifically to succeed. So I address this by looking at site factors like soil characteristics, hydrology, climate data, and the influence of the vegetation community and how these factors interact with and potentially affect camas populations. Next, I wanted to know what would be the best method to increase the number of camas on the site using preferred restoration techniques. So to do this, I compared um, different restoration methods, first looking at seeding, then I did a, uh, or yeah, first doing seeding with a fall and a spring seeding. And then I also looked at bulbs to find out if there was a difference in germination counts between putting out one-year-old bulbs versus two-year-old bulbs. Um, as well as planting the bulbs at different depths. And uh, how did that compare to the seed treatments? And then additionally introduced uh, disturbance treatment, which mimics some aspects of traditional harvest methods by aerating the soil, removing that sod later and reducing the uh, competition through bulb removal. And then finally use that information to create a restoration protocol that can be applied to recover camas prairies across the Pacific Northwest. So um, did some vegetation monitoring, basically determined species composition and germination counts to monitor the effectiveness of each treatment. 
And then I also looked at soil site factors. So I looked at these characteristics because they're indicators of the ability of a site to have access or they're indicators of the ability of the plant to have access to water, potential for root penetration, movement in soil. Um, and these were things that I learned were important for CAMIS through my literature search and uh, they're measurable. So they have a, they have some biological meaning to plant growth and it's a measure, it's measurable that can, um, it's a measurement that can be accessed by, from an applied management perspective. So it's something we can actually use hands-on in the field. Um, so we didn't detect significant differences in soil physical properties like soil bulk density, pH, texture, or water retention capabilities. But we did see a, a difference in site conditions. So overall, high camas density areas uh, were associated with lower elevation. So that resulted in more water accumulation, less sod forming or pasture grasses, low organic matter content, higher soil temperatures, and higher, higher soil moisture during significant climactic periods um, when compared to the low camas density areas. So what this does is it gives us something to focus on in terms of characteristics that can help to promote Kim's Prairie restoration projects. So goals or characters to identify. So um, best treatment methods depended on the chemist population density area that we were working in. In the low density plots, all bulb treatments were um, successful, followed by fall seeding, uh, with there being no really significant difference between those treatment types. In the high density plots, all the bulb treatments followed by disturbance treatments and then spring seeding treatments were most successful respectively, um, but there wasn't really a significant difference between fall and spring seeding that we found. We also identified the importance of aerating the soil and removing the sod layer to create ideal site conditions for restoration and that decreased competition with chemist germination and increased the available habitat space. Um, and this only supports that traditional ecological knowledge that's shared by Nez Perce diggers that the more you dig, the more you get. Um, so this stresses the importance and balance to implementing digging and harvesting to support chemist populations in restoration projects. Uh, so I like to think about daffodils and tulips in this scenario, pull them apart, you give them more space and they do better. They have similar purpose. Overall, we found that hydrology and vegetative community were the driving forces for camas population differences at the sites. So the importance of providing these uh, proper site conditions, meaning ensuring that there's adequate hydrology. So we at Prairie, we found that about seven and a half months um, of uh, saturated soils was ideal. And then reducing or eliminating invasive species, particularly those sod forming grasses, that it's really hard for the camas to pop up through. Um, aerating the soil reduces competition and creates uh, bare ground, both of which are beneficial for camas germination. And best treatment methods on the site conditions, uh, particularly if there's a reproductive camas population at the site, um, or depend, they depend on um, if you have it at the site. So if, if this is the case, a disturbance treatment, which creates bare ground, aerates the soil, breaks apart that sod layer, um, that will provide really positive habitat for, um, for the camas and uh, a relatively low amount of input from the land man manager. But if you don't have a native population available with you or at that site, once you, um, you can, once these site conditions uh, that have been identified are met, both propagal types, so seeds or bulbs are good treatments for using for restoration projects, bringing camas back to the prairies. That being said, false seeding treatments require significantly less resources compared to the methods needing spring, um, or sorry, needing to produce uh, bulbs. So it's recommended over, um, so seeding, false seeding is recommended over outplanting in projects where project resources are limited or where you have a little bit more time to, uh, to wait till you get uh, a mature cannabis plant and um, reproductive. Disturbance alone will not be effective unless a propagule source is added to the soil. I feel like that makes a lot of sense, but it's important that we have to say it. 
Um, additionally, spring seeding, it wasn't really significantly different uh, than fall seeding, and so it's not the best option. It, um, it requires a cold stratification process. It also can lead to the seeds being on the ground longer, so you have potential predation issues, so it's better to do it in the fall. Uh, through the study, we found no evidence to support that germination was affected by bulb depth in the first year. So we wanted to see if smaller, younger bulbs could be put deeper in the soil and still germinate, um, which they were. Uh, it's um, from this we can conclude that the bulbs require little outplant, little uh, sorry, little effort for outplanting methods. However, planting bulbs deeper might simulate some of that selective harvesting that happens um, when, you're, when you're mixing up the soil. And some of the literature thinks or recommends that that might lead to maturity faster because you're helping that bulb reach its uh, preferred depth. And um, so it's just giving it a little bit of a push. So we need to continue tracking germination counts and monitoring uh, mature, maturation timing between the flower development and each camas population. Um, that would benefit the protocol and inform reproductive timetables because those are still a little bit iffy right now. Um, and then working with some of our partners, concerns over invasive species treatment methods um, and needs are growing. So we're looking into ways to assess best management practices regarding integrated pest management in camas berries and potential effects on access and edibility of harvesting camas that has been treated with. Uh, herbicides. We've also met with the Clearwater Soil Water Conservation District, who's working with the Clearwater Highway District to redesign culverts. They want to get the water off the roads, so we want to take their water and put it on the wetland. So it's an opportunity for a win-win where we can help them and they can help us. And then finally, we continue doing our citizen science project work that we've been doing for the past 17 years, working with local youth on hands-on campus monitoring. So other stuff that's going on in the greater Camas community, um, went to the Cascadia Prairie Oak Partnership Conference this past fall and got to hear about some cattle ranchers that are really interested in finding ways to, um, to both uh, work agricultural production and Camas Prairie meats into their grazing protocols. So like putting cattle at specific rates on these camas prairies um, where they are already, but maybe thinking more about timing. When do you remove the cattle off of that property so that allows for the camas to still grow, not be eaten by the cattle, do its thing, senesce, seed, and then um, bring the cattle back when the, when the camas would be less impacted. So as I mentioned, we have lost a lot of these camas prairies to agriculture and these, these agricultural operations are still around and still will be. So if there's a way that we can find common ground, um, then that would be a really exciting protocol that we could start working with. So, um, and then something else that they were talking about is seed and feed. So feeding the cattle things that would encompass or encapsulate camas seed that could work its way through the cow system and then be distributed so it actually is a seed dispersal method. So this is stuff that's going on right now. People are interested in and people are looking at. This isn't stuff that I'm doing, but it's stuff that's happening. Um, and then additionally, we, we do have a large group of camas enthusiasts, ranging from dig out diggers to landowners, uh, government agencies, non-government agencies, individuals, private sector people. Um, we're all coming together to share and learn more about camas. Uh, it's kind of, it's been around for a really long time, but sometimes finding this information can be really difficult to, to lead to these restoration projects. So um, we're trying to create a network of CAMIS practitioners and enthusiasts to, to share some of this knowledge and help move forward some of this CAMIS restoration work. Um, I'll just quickly read their mission statement. Um, they participate in information exchange and respectful dialogue with indigenous people about the intellectual knowledge and cultural traditions concerning CAMIS. This includes advocacy for eco-cultural restoration, preservation, and indigenous people's access to and co-management of CAMIS and places where it grows. And we've already seen this a uh, group in action. They petitioned the Army Corps of Engineers about an upcoming project um, that is potentially going to displace a CAMIS prairie in Oregon. 
So it's really exciting to see the group come together and start to take some action and move forward. So if anybody is interested in joining that, or hear more about it, the listserv is currently under development. Feel free to contact me and I can uh, connect you with that group. And then hearing about projects like what Steve and Jen are going to talk about um, and what they're working on and sharing, uh, continuing this work as we learn and take on more restoration projects to restore campus prairies can help build that network of campus practitioners and scholarship that will help us understand and have better, um, do better at rest restoring these, these really important ecosystems. So I hope that this information um, will help benefit campus restoration and primarily give some ideas about site preparation and site characteristics to look for when doing campus restoration. Um, but also, I wanna help grow that campus community that's invested in campus restoration because it is so crucial. So I do wanna thank some people, um, all the people who helped me with all of my field work. And then uh, I wanna just acknowledge the many people that came before me and shared uh, this knowledge of this special plant with me and with all of us. So I am going to ask you guys to hold your questions, much like this pygmy owl is holding this junko hostage. Um, I know it's difficult, but Jen and Steve have a lot to say, and we're going to hear from them now for questions. Okay, we're going to switch to the next presentation. And I'm going to share this. Excellent. Thank you so much, Katie, and thank you for traveling to the prairie to here. Um, so I was so excited to discover Katie a couple of years ago and her research and really has helped inform this project uh, that we undertook a number of years ago in the Blackfoot River Valley. So I'll talk about first. I'll just give you a little background on uh, Conservancy, of course. Um, what has led us to this campus restoration project? And really, what it boils down to is partners, partners, partners. We don't do anything without teaming up and working together. Um, and so, the principal partners that I'll be talking about are the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, who are informing and funding the work that that Jen and I are doing. And then I'll talk about the specific Bureau of Indian Affairs program that's funding the, the project through CSKT that's, that's helping uh, the BLM TNC do this exciting campus restoration work. But what we're trying to do is take these sort of meadows that Katie was talking about that are been heavily altered over the last 150 years, try to turn them back into what they once were. So, so just very briefly on uh, Nature Conservancy, that's who I work for. I'm the Western Montana land steward for the last 19 years. Uh, so I'm working on the west side of the crown of the continent. TNC only works in fairly specific places around Montana where there are large intact ecosystems or systems still in place. That's where we focused on through our science investigations to see where are the best places that we can have the most impact essentially save those systems. So these are the areas that we're working around Montana and Montana Forest is the program that I work with primarily. And then focusing in a little more, um, if you've been paying attention to the news for the last 20, 25 years, there's been a big problem in West Virginia where uh, the corporate timber companies were divesting of their land. Plum Creek Timber Company, was uh, it's since we schwacked all of their timber, we're not making enough money. Wanted to capitalize or uh, 
make as much money as they could on what they had left, which was land. So they started subdividing off land, selling off 160s or larger uh, communities around Montana. NTNC realized that we have a serious problem here. We need to get after saving some of this landscape. So over the last 25 years, TNC's bought 350,000 acres from Plum Creek. Many of those lands have gone to entities like the BLM, talking about today, and Forest Service. So these, all this, the stipple lands up here, now this entire area surrounding Missoula, are, is that 350,000 acres that, that we've acquired. The red are what we still have. You can see we've created new wildlife management areas, new state forests, new state parks, blocked up national forest lands, blocked up to BLM lands and created whole new like BLM ownerships. And it's enabled us to really start to tackle some really big restoration issues on the landscape like forest restoration, in this case, some camas restoration. When you don't have that fractured management, that checkerboard of lands that are owned, every other section is owned by a corporate timber group, at least, it makes it really hard to do broad scale restoration, especially when you're at uh, the subdivision in those lands. So we're gonna focus in on that red circle area. Another thing I would just say about this slide is, um, we didn't realize this at first, the Conservancy when we started slowly moving these lands that we had acquired into federal ownership until a tribal uh, member is a, Forest Service fishery biologist, Shane Hendrickson, told me one day, he said, you know, we've really done the CSKT, the Federated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, a huge favor because that quarter of a million acres that have gone over to the feds now have fully restored our treaty rights. And that, again, is another thing that led us to this project, having those treaty rights restored back to the I'm not savvy enough to use it this time, but it's all written out, right? Um, and well, that last where that circle was is kind of right where it says Calispe on this map. I'm going to talk a lot from sort of a tribal perspective, I guess I'll say. We did have someone from CSKT who was going to be here, our, uh, our one of our coordinators with the tribes. And she had she got pulled away to go to some fire training in Florida. So unfortunately, Whitney Malaterre wasn't able to join us here. During that restoration journey that, that Tegan mentioned, um, I wound up being a tribal restoration botanist for CSKT for three years before the Conservancy. So I do have some background. Um, so further laying sort of the, the groundwork here, that blue area is the traditional territory of the Salish, Police Bay uh, nations. And that really, uh, overlaps very well with a lot of the Plum Creek work that TNC has done, as well as our work down in the High Divide headwaters. A lot of overlap with the treaty lands or areas that the tribes are concerned about and the areas that the Conservancy is concerned about. So uh, now I'm going to jump ship a little bit to uh, a federal acronym, RTRL, I'll keep talking about RTRL throughout the rest of my talk. Um, reserve treaty rights. Folks are aware of the Hellgate Treaty. If a number of you know about that, the Hellgate Treaty of 1855, which uh, the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes, which essentially there's three tribes, the Salish, the Calise Bay, uh, or also called Pondere, and the, and the Kootenai Band, they met with Governor Stevens and essentially reserved the reservation that I showed on that last uh, map, as well as tr treaty rights across that whole traditional area. Um, and in doing so, um, you know, they, that enabled them to go back on those lands and, and practice their traditional gathering, hunting, encampments, those sorts of things. As I mentioned, when those lands are turned back over to the feds that fully restored those treaty rights. The Nature Conservancy, we also honor treaty rights on our ownership across North America. 
private lands, treaty rights are not necessarily uh, exercised or tribes can't exercise their treaty rights on those lands, but the conservancy chooses to honor treaty rights. Anyway, the Reserve Treaty Right Lands Program is a really exciting program under the Bureau of Indian Affairs that lets tribes reconnect with those places off reservation and partner with, with folks to uh, manage those off reservation tribal resources and rights. So this red outline on this map shows the pink nature conservancy lands and the yellow BLM lands where we're doing this collaborative restoration work with the CSKT, Confederated Source Indian Tribes. I would just point out that yellow polygon in the middle of the red, when we started uh, 25 years ago, the BLM owned 40 acres. And through these Plum Creek uh, dispositions or transfers to the feds, now there's about 40,000 acres of federal land. That red polygon overlaps really well with this map, which um, is an excerpt from a Black River place name map showing uh, the importance of that landscape to the tribes to this day. They have place names all over the landscape there. And the Salis Bay Culture Committee, which is an elders advisory council at the tribes, they've uh, cataloged and collected I think something like 3,000 placements. Um, this is this is the city's Kalis Bay Culture Committee. I like to think of these folks as my bosses. I work for the tribes. This is who we went to when we wanted advice on how to restore a certain area, or what plants to work with. Would we be allowed to work with those plants? How should we work with those plants in a respectful way? So to this day, I'd like to, to think of them as my boss or as our bosses. And they really helped us focus and guide where should we do this RTRL, this restoration work on the Nature Conservancy landscape and the BLM. So we met with them, where on this landscape are you most interested in us trying to do some restoration? This is a little bit older picture from about 2014. And sadly, about half of these elders have passed on. So it's hard to overstate the importance of meeting with these folks, learning what they have to share, and getting going with the work while they're still here. Um, so in developing our uh, our work plans on what to do under that RTRL program. I should say that the RTRL program is primarily a forestry and fuels project or a fund from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, from the BIA. So really it's looking at how can we restore our forests in a good way. But again, through these field visits and consultation with the elders, that really led us to uh, this canvas restoration work as being a very important element of what we were going to try to do with the tribes. So many site visits here were with our, our board of trustees and tribal partners, some U of M professors, BLM folks out on one of the prairies, and then lots and lots of forestry tours. The other thing I should say, I meant to say earlier, is another big part of this RTL program is to increase tribal employment, increased connections to the land that may have been severed over the you know, last four or five generations. And uh, yeah, just really to reconnect and restore those landscapes and those, and those tribal connections. So you're probably wondering, what, what do they look like on the ground? It's, it's a little bit like some of the pictures that Katie had where you can see there, we got dandelion, not native. Lots of non-native tame pasture grass in there, and then a scattering of remnant canvas. So uh, in, in developing our project here, we went out in the ideal bloom time and mapped out where did we still have remnant canvas, which also tends to indicate where do you have the, the all the other conditions like the proper hydrology. Um, this is up in Gold Creek. So if you've been up there before, you can see in the distance, there are some large pines. That's Trim Meadow, if you've ever been up in Gold Creek. I highly recommend 
visiting Prim Meadow. Um, so these, the uh, cannabis populations obviously have been reduced through many of the disturbance factors that Katie talked about. So there is a history of grazing in places like Gold Creek, uh, the tame pasture grass that was seeded in or is naturalized. Um, plenty of weeds, of course, probably some historic use of herbicides at perhaps pretty high rates. Um, disturbance from the logging, you'll find skitter trails right across the middle of some of these camas prairies. Um, forest encroachment, crowding out the camas. Those were sort of the main factors that we found up there uh, or, or on these former prairies. So here's an example, Lost, uh, Lost Horse Creek Meadows, which is a tributary to the Clearwater River. Those poor camas plants are trying to survive in a sea of hound's tongue right there. Um, and then this the upper gold creek where you can see the lodgepole pines are starting to encroach upon the meadow, largely because of lack of fire in the system. We found a lot of canvas in some surprising places too. This is a really special place called Lost Prairie. Uh, Lost Prairie Creek is also a tributary to the Clearwater River, and it has these fabulous seasonal lakes almost, large ponds out in the middle. But I'm standing in what is essentially this is a blue bunch wheatgrass, Idaho fescue grassland community. So almost a xeric grassland community, but all that purplish blue you see is canvas. So we found it was just very surprising find it in a place such as that. We also found some other pretty exciting cultural plants in that meadow. So again, through the, the consultations with the tribes, and I should mention the tribes have a wonderful native plant nursery that's been in place for over 20 years now. Um, and so they had some pretty good chops on how to propagate native plants, conifers, as well as native plants. Um, so our go-to thing before we learned about Katie's research was let's just collect, let's just grow a lot of plants, put some plants back out in the landscape. Um, Servancy's done a lot of work, again, through the Plum Creek land acquisitions in and around the Potomac Valley. And so I was aware of this one remnant nice camas patch on the edge of the, of the Potomac Valley. And so that wound up being our seed collection site for uh, to date for the conservancy work. Talking about Potomac, I wanted to read a little excerpt from a book that the Salish Calise Bay Cultural Committee put out about the Salish people and the Lewis and Clark expedition. This is the tribe's response essentially to all the hubbaloo around Lewis and Clark, which they were quite confused about because Lewis and Clark were in Western Montana for what, a week or something? And of course, they've been here forever. So this is the, a wonderful publication that you can find on like ABE books and whatnot, or by the culture committee. But this is what it has to say about um, what is now Potomac Valley. Folks know where Potomac is, just up the Blackfoot River a little ways. Kalsa or Epluitwe. Kalsa is an old word for cannabis. Epluitwe means it has cooked cannabis, a place of cooked cannabis. Kalsa or Epluitwe was perhaps the most important cannabis digging ground in all of Western Montana. The broad open valley maintained by tribal people with the careful application of periodic fire was a great sea of camas, and many Western tribes would journey there to partake of the abundance. Salish, Upper and Lower Pondere, or Calif Kalispell, Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, Nez Perce, Kootenai, and many others came to Kalsa, or Epilitwe, often on their way to Buffalo in early summer. So, and that's, I didn't realize that until I read this, that that seen on some really old maps from the 1880s. Before there was the town of Potomac, it just says Camas Prairie across that vast area. And I've heard two other stories about the Potomac area that sort of signify its importance. One is that when the uh, first homesteaders came to the up into the Blackfoot, that some of them stood 
maybe it was more open then. They're up on Lubrick Hill and looked down and all they saw was blue because they came in June and they thought it was a lake and they turned around and went somewhere else. And so it, it was spared for a little longer, maybe a few years, maybe a few decades. And then I also had a, a tribal elder tell me once that because of that profusion of camas, you know, that's a long list of tribes there. Because of that profusion of camas, it was like a place of peace where there was enough food for everyone so you could set your, your battles aside and just dig camas, dig and gather camas for your, your winter stores. Well, we can't restore Potomac, but these other little meadows that are on that are up Gold Creek and around the old Flint Creek lands are places that we can restore. Brindles from there. So you work on what you can, right? So again, this was our seed collection site. I've gone out there several years. The the uh, the rancher who still owns this, it was her grandmother's homestead place, and she's honored to have us out there collecting seed. So we brought the seed to the uh, Sales and Kootenai Tribal Nursery up in Ronan, and they are they propagated some plants for us. That's not camas, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually bitter that the BLM is also a bit contract grown by, by the tribal nursery. So we're about 10, I guess I should say they're about 10 air miles from this site to uh, some of the camas. So not too far a seed transfer zone. And people get, I know the park service gets really wrapped around. Seed transfer zones have to be very close together. Um, some of our Camas meadows were, had had a lot of impact because they had open roads right through them and others like Lost Prairie were not so impacted. But this is an example of a site in East Twin Creek, which is immediately downstream of Gold Creek. Um, the top picture there, you can see that that's actually a homeless encampment, uh, which we deal with a lot of homeless camps or used to on the conservancy lands. And to try to control some of the illegal camping and off-road mud bogging in the Camas Meadow, Plum Creek Timber Company had dug huge trenches and barricades on either side, which effectively drained the, you know, messed up the hydrology of this Camas Meadow. Again, this is an open forest service road right through the middle of it. Uh, there was, and out to the, to the right here is all sorts of other campsites that had old roads leading to them, dumping, I mean, kind of you name it. The only thing we didn't have here was grazing, which is really nice, convenient. Um, so we knew we needed to correct the hydrology, we knocked the berms down, topsoiled them, uh, did a native seeding on those. RTRL helped pay for all of this work. Uh, put in the what we call a human exclusion fence, and then close the area actually to camping and entry. Put up signs all on there. Uh, and then the tribal crew is, and you can't see them, they're just off of the screen to the left, but they're out there thinning some of the forest encroachment. Very careful weed spots. We don't want to kill any camas when we're out there. We don't have enough of it as it is. So we're trying to spray at the optimal time of year to not impact the native forbs and also spray it a manner that will not kill those forbs. So we're using the least toxic chemicals at the least toxic rates um, and the least toxic method, which is backpack spraying, spot spraying, or ATV spraying spot. So almost never broadcast, right? That would just be too destructive to what remnant forms we have. So that this is a uh, some of our contract crew and TNC staff spraying. That's actually somewhere that Peter is very familiar with. This is Dancing Prairie, not, not up in Gold Creek, but I didn't have a good picture of our weed spraying crew up there. But, um, and I should have a shout out to Native Solutions Restoration. If anybody knows Michael Pecora here in Missoula, actually lives in Bonner. He's been our go-to weed sprayer guy for 16, 17 years contractor. If you're going to hire a weed spray contractor, hire one that has native plants tattooed all over their arms. That's my recommendation because you know they're devoted there. No, not dissing your Scottish system. You're Scottish, I understand. <laughs> but native plant propagation takes quite a few years. That's another thing about planting plants or planting bulbs that can take 
up to three years. That's how long it took us to grow the plants that we were, we put out there eventually. We were targeting 8,000 plants from the tribal nursery. After three years, we finally had uh, 6,500 plants. And so we did a, a spring planting, and, a, and then we had to wait for some to grow up a little more and did a fall planting for the ones that had grown up. Um, if you're there with propagation, we they were sewn into 16 cubic inch, uh, what are called D4, D16s. Um, so containerized tubelings, and and we're planting them out with the hodad here. This is one of this is our commercial planting crew at Gold Creek, uh, planting one of the larger meadows there. Um, you can see the, the plants are nice and green here in the spring. In the fall, you still want a tube, but as soon as you pull them out of the tube, all you wind up with is a little bulb, in which case, oftentimes it's the size of your pinky fingernail. Kind of hard to find that, hard to handle. So there are some challenges to Ball planting there and ball planting that we you know, if you're going to plant plants. I would prefer spring planting going forward, but you also have to think about survivability, right? It's the best time in that regard. Um, you can see also in, these are the, the map meadows and very small areas within those meadows have the proper hydrology to really be to receive plants. Um, so that the purple polygons are where we did our planting. This the planting was done in. 2001, um, and I'll say it, we don't, that's not enough time has passed yet to really understand the survivability or the success of that plant. There's another example of up in um, Gold Creek or what we call the Gold Creek Forks where the West Fork of Gold Creek and Gold Creek come together. It's a really nice complex of meadows up there. Um, Interesting that the principal disturbance up in this part of the world was a Forest Service ranger station. Very little history of grazing, except directly associated with the ranger station and their hang and grazing operations. And since the 70s, there has been any grazing. So that has been removed long ago, which again helps with restoration projects, generally speaking. Sometimes grazing can help, but not in this case. So you can see the spring and the fall plantings up there. Put up on my notes. I think Jen is up next. Oh. So, just like that. And just like that. But don't worry, guys. I'll try to keep this pretty brief. Um, my name is Jen McNew. I work for the Bureau of Land Management. Um, I work mostly with native plants, so I've been lucky to work on these RTRL projects and especially these canvas restoration projects. Um, the first thing I wanna mention, just like Steve's been saying, that the BLM has been acquiring lots of land in this lower Blackfoot corridor area. Um, and this is a little visual to show you just that increase. <laughs> so you see right here, that's the 40 acres that the BLM managed in 2004. And now, 2023, we manage 44,000 acres uh, with the likelihood of increasing that acreage in the next few years. Um, and just like Steve said, that's really important for this context because now that this land is coming into federal hands, it does mean that those reserve treaty rights are restored. And any member from the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribe who wants to exercise their rights to hunt and gather on this land legally has the right to, which I think is really important for us as land managers to think about. And it's also really cool that we are working with these, with these partners um, in the RTRL program where we're actually getting the funding to work on restoration of things like Kamet. So in the pink here is the Kamet sites that we've been focusing on in the BLM. And then the green you can see is where Steve and TNC have been focusing their efforts. This is Gold Creek. Uh, and two of the main spots that I'm going to talk about are Nine Mile Prairie and Belmont Creek. Um, if you guys know Nine Mile Prairie Road, as you're kind of getting over access to, especially in this last year, access to the Blackfoot, um, that's kind of the main thoroughfare to be on that part of the Blackfoot. And so just like Steve was saying, um, 
the sites that we've been seeing, well, first I should mention, just like TNC did, we surveyed lots of land and we found about 250 acres of remnant prairie. And we decided to focus on about 40 acres along the Blackfoot. And just like with the TNC sites, we had lots of encroachment from predominantly pasture grasses, uh, as well as lots of weeds, noxious and not noxious, and encroaching conifers. So what have we done so far? Um, we have an office that has done a lot of things um, and we're moving, moving forward with campus restoration. So essentially we've done a little of a lot of stuff, um, including we, uh, our fuel specialists, as well as other members of our team um, started with our first meadow burn. We, we were able to burn about five acres of that meadow. And like Katie mentioned, burning is really, really incredibly critical for camas. So we're obviously looking to do more of that in the future. Um, we also have been working in the last few years to cut the encroaching conifers. We make sure to do that in the winter time so as not to affect any of the camas population. Um, we've also been <laughs> working away uh, on seed collecting both of carrots and other associated species. Um, my body mentor, William Mitzgarin, he has really, really helped with seed collecting in the last few years. Um, and then we've also done a lot of targeted weed spraying and thoughtful treatments of weeds in our different spots. So, what have I think the interesting, most interesting areas that we've been working on as a team, as an office, is the Belmont Meadow. Um, this is an old homestead site, and it was completely covered with pasture grasses. I mean, it continues to be, uh, but it has also had a lot of work, a lot of restoration work done with it in the last 20 years. So in 2003 to 2005, um, our fisheries team brought uh, horses along to pull large wooden debris into the stream. And that was essentially to make it more complex, make it better and more complex habitat for fisheries. And they've also done some riparian planting, but that has been really, really helpful for canvas and for other riparian species. So where there used to be tansy and rush, or tansy, there's now things like rush. and um, this is a site that we see one or two canvas bulbs, but we're really not seeing any right now. It's like mostly pasture grass and things like that. Um, but I just kind of wanted to use this as an example that restoration for one resource can often be so critical for restoration for other resources. So one thing I love about working with this um, is that we do work together and things say that help fish are going to also help camas. Um, so it all kind of comes together. And since it's RTRL project, we've also removed the conifers and continued weed treatment in this area. Um, we've also done some a little bit of camas direct seeding, as well as seeding some other associated species here. Nine Mile Prairie is another one of our sites, and our weed team has been working on Nine Mile Prairie for a while, and they have been putting some serious effort into it. Um, this is just, we don't have a lot of before and after photos with this kind of restoration because it's definitely a marathon. Um, but here's a good example of what some concentrated and focused weed treatment can do. This is kind of after flowering, but this is pretty concentrated Dalmatian toad fox. And this is the same spot, slightly different angle, <laughs> um, about five years later. And the Dalmatian toad flax is pretty well managed, like still coming up. Um, but you can see we're starting to get grasses, we're starting to get some camas up. Um, so that's been really exciting. We also have been having, we've also been working with the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribal Nursery, the native plant nursery. They have been growing uh, Camus out for us. They have been cleaning and storing all of our seeds and they've just been a really, really valuable resource and have provided some really great, great guidance um, with next steps. And so they've always been really great help. So our next step, next steps. 
um, we really want to and are going to uh, introduce, reintroduce fire into these meadow system in hopefully the next few years. Uh, Belmont Meadows is prepped. <laughs> So our next step really is to introduce fire. And at that point, we'll be able to get into our direct seeding. And we have 10,000 plugs growing um, with the Salish Kootenai native plant nursery. Uh, so we'll be working on planting those. Um, and then I, I also wanna say, we're gonna continue working on restoration, um, both as lands move from TNC to BLM. And we're gonna continue working on restoration kind of trying to do it holistically, um, where we're working with our hydrologists and our fisheries biologists, our fuel specialists, our weed specialists. That's a really great thing working about this office is that we can get a lot done as a team. So here's an example of an office birthday we had this fall where we had people from every discipline out as well as this is on Nature Conservancy land. Um, so we had Steve guiding us and um, lots of lots of people came out from the BOM and from lots of other places. And so I think it's important to remember that we, it's a little daunting. All of this stuff takes so many steps, but it all helps the system. And we're, we're kind of all working on it together. So that's kind of the next steps on that. I should say that wasn't me guiding. That was the BLM have a wonderful team of people. Yeah. And so Claire. It was a multi guiding. Claire Romanko is their hydrologist, and Ernie McKenzie, who's their fishery biologist, were actually, they went and took a class for a week on how to build beaver dam analogs. And then they came back and applied them for the first time on the conservancy land. So we yeah. were all out there and we had CSKT folks out helping us with that. And, that it, day. and also, I think it's, um, it's kind of interesting. Ernie, our fisheries biologist, was a technician uh, in the early 2000s when they started that restoration on Belmont Meadows. And now he's kind of heading up the fisheries program. And they're trying to do the riparian, uh, they're trying to do a lot more with riparian restoration, which will be really exciting to see. Yeah, that, I don't know how to back this thing up, but that last picture was actually a very incised channel of. Wild Horse Creek, a little drainage to Gold Creek that we actually identified when we were out there mapping our canvas. We we're like, oh my gosh, we have an incised channel here as a function where it was straightened by the Forest Service to create more hay meadow. And that was, of course, draining the canvas. So obviously, it's all, it all goes together when you're trying to do landscape scale restoration. So, next steps for the conservancy is pretty much the same as the BLM. And We've been unsuccessful in getting fall burns done on, on those grassland areas. There's some complexities associated with that, but we also wanted to get the encroachment out first and get the weeds managed for a couple of different seasons before we put fire on there so we weren't exacerbating the weed situation. Um, this, the, the burning effort in the Blackfoot, it's actually, that's where really collaborative burning is, is hatching in, in Montana. We've got Scribe Fire Working Group, where essentially every agency, private landowners, NGOs like the Conservancy and the Blackfoot Challenge, tribes are coming over the hill. All of us are burning together on like an all hands on land to code. So when we're out there, we might have eight different entities represented on burn day. So that's a picture up there with some of that combined crew on a burn out in Nine Mile Prairie this last, uh, this last year. And then also one of our forest burns earlier. So, um, but yeah, it's really a, the burning is, it's not that expensive to do the prescribed burning, but it's a big lift from the coordination side of things and the smoke management side of things. Here in Missoula, you get inversions. All of our smoke up in the Blackfoot may want to come down here and sit on you for a couple of days, and we don't want to, we have to time it all very, very well. So. A lot of hurdles with prescribed fire. That's a whole nother story. But um, prescribed fire is a really essential part of restoration. Um, so this this OTRL project and the and the camas restoration, it's this whole collaboration with with Confederate Salish Kootenai tribes, 
um, has led us in another, down a, a bunch of other really exciting paths too. So um, with the Conservancy, we've already done one rematriation. That's a return of land back to the tribes with their land back. We had a on-reservation nature preserve that we gave back to the tribes back in 2019. We have two other rematriations that we're hoping to do to the tribes of cultural sites. So that's super exciting work to be involved in. Um, and the tribes have you know, identified those places on the landscape, on the conservancy on lands, that these are, these are priority sites for them. Um, one thing around restoration, you know, I've, I've been in the restoration ecology business since right after I graduated from U of M, so since 1991. And when I first started in restoration, we thought, oh, you just grow up some native plants. Ideally, they're site adapted. You grow them and you plant them out and you're done, right? And we, whether it was on a park service site where we were obliterating an old campground or a coal mine site in eastern Montana, that's what we were doing. And not getting great success. Then we realized, okay, it's the soil microbiome. You got to get the soils right. You know, if you've got mined over topsoils or subsoils, you need to put the, the biota back in back in the soil. Years later, jump ship to the nature conservancy. It's like, oh, restoration. We need to do logging. Logging is restoration. I never would have dreamed that I would be a logger back when I was a hippie at U of M. But um, so we've done a lot, I mean, by logging, I really mean forest restoration, but we're thinning from below, leaving the biggest and best trees, opening things up, removing encroachment. And then it's like, oh, well, I mean, wait a minute. One of the most significant things missing from restoration is fire, right? That's like, so we got to get fire back on there, all these things. And then for me, really, that you haven't fully restored it until you've restored the humans back to that state as well. There's cultural traditions, restoring. I and mean, that's what, like the final grace of restoration. And so this is this project has led us down that path in a really good way. So a picture is worth like a thousand words, right? I love this picture. Uh, when I was a student at U of M in the in the late '80s and living on the Flathead Reservation, uh, Agnes Vandenberg, she was legendary to all of us circles I ran. Um, so she was this this Salish Yaya was she taught so many generations of her own people and anybody who would show up at her cultural encampment on Valley up in Yonalu. It was open to all. She just would teach those traditions year after year after year to anyone who showed up. Um, sadly she passed away in 1989 but her spirit lives on those kids and those kids are now adults so i feel like we will be successful with this restoration and those kids as kids and their kids can go back out to those camels campus and gather camels campus. that's the measure of success here so that's the I think that's it. Thank you for sitting through all of that. <laughs>